Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Thriving Adoptees Podcast. So today I'm delighted to be joined by Erin, Erin Bouchard from uh, from Canada. Um, delighted to uh, uh, delighted to have you on the show. We had a, such a great conversation uh, last time, Erin. Really looking forward to this uh, to this conversation today. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you too. Cool. So Erin is uh, an uh, adoptive mum, and she also works with adoptive and, and, and foster parents. And we came up with uh, a kind of quite a, a broad starting off point, a broad theme for um, for the episode today, which is being the best parent we can be. So uh, it's nice and aspirational and it? it's like you know we're 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 we're, we're shooting for the start here <laughs> um, sure. uh, we're 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 not going to get down into the the tricky stuff we're going we're we're going to uh, hopefully lift up the uh the audience and when we lift them up they're going to be in a better place to deal mm-hmm. with that, that tricky stuff because that's where we need to be i was listening to something on this this morning and uh yeah it starts with us doesn't it it starts it with sure us yeah. and our level of our level of consciousness, our uh our mood, our resilience. I don't know. What what would what would you say it starts with? What? I would say as an adoptive parent, it really starts with knowing yourself, knowing your own values, knowing your own triggers, and just working through some of um your own past as a parent, right? We often talk about adoptees trauma and adoptees past and and the reasons they were brought into care or the reasons they needed to be adopted Um, but I truly believe to be the best parent you can be you have to start with your own um, past and your own triggers even if you were um, raised in a fairly healthy home or you don't you don't consider yourself to have experienced trauma there's still things that will trigger you as a parent yeah okay um now, co- coincidentally, I wrote a little. I, I I wrote a little note in my book. I've got this little. Uh, I don't know what what size it is. Uh, we call it A six in the UK. It's <laughs> kind of like a quarter A four, just like a little. Yeah. Note. And when I'm out and about listening to podcasts and um, other people's podcasts and <laughs> audio books, I I tend to like I, I I send myself an email with little notes, and then when I get home, I transcribe them into my little notebook so I can look at it. And I, I I wrote down four words, no, five words in my little notebook this morning. And it was self-self or ego-self. You know, this self thing, it, the word gets, the word gets kind of banged, bang, uh, banded around. And, and, you know, so we have a look, you know, it, I, I used to be into self-development. You know, we use this word. Self, mm-hmm. self-development, self uh, you know, taking care of yourself. Self is used in so many different, um, uh, so many different contexts. Mm-hmm. When you're talking about self-awareness, you were talking about, um, uh, I think you, as I wrote, I scribbled down, um, values, uh, values, triggers, um, uh, our, our own behaviours, um when we're talking about self-awareness, it's it, it's about what we think, what we feel, what we do, how we react. Can you unpack that a little bit? Because sure, yeah, sure. So here's an example of that. Um, I was raised in a home where stealing was uh, a big deal, right? My parents really in, enforced in me that we don't steal, that we don't tell lies, that we're truthful. That was a really important thing for them that they instilled in us this ability to um, be respectful of other people's property, not take it. Um, and so I have an adopted daughter who has very poor impulse control. She knows and she can tell you like what's right and what's wrong. She knows stealing is wrong. Um, but in the moment, she see something and she wants it, she takes it. Um, And so myself being very much aware that stealing is something that was so ingrained in me. And so like, you know, the first few times she stole, I made it this big deal. And I, well, I asked her all these questions and it ended up in this big drawn out fight over 
you know, a dollar or something from somebody's wallet. Right. And so now that I'm more aware that, that this could be a trigger point for me because it's something that was, you know, so ingrained into me as a child and through my teen years. And I recognize that her upbringing is very different than mine and her values are different and her ability to, to, you know, think in the moment and rationalize it and, and access that thinking part of her brain isn't as strong as as some kids are. Um, I can just be more aware of the potential for a huge, you know, something little turning into a big fight because she's triggered and I'm triggered and, and we're just a hot mess together. Whereas now, you know, I can recognize, okay, it's, I'm going to take some deep breaths myself. I'm going to make sure I'm regulated. I'm going to approach this situation differently. And it's not going to be the hill that I die on because, you know, I understand the difference in, in our own upbringings. Yeah. And I value things that are different now that I'm an adult than, than necessarily my parents did when I was a kid. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, we don't normally go into, um, practices, in this on this podcast because you know the tactic stuff is isn't isn't when well, it's not great listening and mm. also uh, i i find it with my own stuff and unless the tactic comes on the back of a shift in my um uh, attention a shift in my awareness uh, a shift in in you know i've i've had a change of heart mm-hmm. tactics don't work unless they've been driven by a, a new idea right so we don't mm. um but it strikes me like um, one of my favorite sayings from one of my favorite mentors I had over the time. He says, it's hard to see the picture when we're in the frame. Mm-hmm. It's hard mm-hmm. to see the picture when we're in the frame, which is for me the kind of a, a brilliant way of summing up this self awareness piece that we're, we're talking about here mm-hmm. in, in that context of self. So, is there anything that you've come across? Um, that could uh, help the uh, help the adoptive parents listening to see the picture, even though that they are in the frame. Hmm. Mm, that's a good question. That's a good way of saying it. Um, I think spending some time understanding yourself, um, and that may look very differently for each person, for each parent. Um, you know, f- figuring out what your own values are. It's something I. That a lot of the parents I've worked with have never really thought about, okay, are these my values because they were my parents' values? Are they my values because I picked them up along the way? Or is it something that I truly value? Um, so recognizing, you know, your own, because because often the things that you value can then become your trigger points, right? So, so seeing the connection between the two um, and also just you know, recognizing where we are being triggered and we need to step back or we need to regulate ourselves because a dysregulated adult can't regulate a child. And so, you know, we often want the next solution for our kids' behaviors or why is my child stealing or why is my child lying? And we often forget to kind of look at ourselves first and realize that we are in that frame with the child. We are part of that equation. Yeah. Um, It's great, isn't it, when when you answer a question ask a question, listen to what the person's got to say. And then, and while you're talking there, I'm thinking maybe you could just Google values exercise. If you Google mm-hmm. values exercise, I'm, I'm sure there'll be like a, a little PDF somewhere that you can download and, um, uh, and, and, and just have a look at the questions and say, right, well, what is it? You know, what, what, what did my parents instill in me you know what if we're if we're looking yeah here's here's the thing so if we're looking for at ourselves it might be tricky but if we said well what was important to our mum and dad when we were growing up Mm. what 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 did i get told off for (laughs) (laughs) um so as I'm thinking that, I was brought up on the actually t- telling the truth was the not hitting my sister, <laughs> anybody, uh, and uh, and telling the truth and doing what you say you're going to do. Mm-hmm. That, that drives me nuts, actually. 
this is like a this is like a free bit of therapy here, Harry. Um, <laughs> it drives me nuts when people don't do what they say. I, I uh, we had a we I'm sitting in a, a in a, an office now, which is a, um, an extension to our house finished last week last year, and the builder he couldn't give a flying toss about doing what he said mm. he was going to do. Mm-hmm. He wasn't a man of his word whatsoever. Mm. And he really triggered me. And he triggered me to the extent that I couldn't speak to him. Mm. Mm-hmm. My wife had to deal with it. So um, maybe, the, maybe those, maybe those, yeah, don't do not do what I do, listeners, right? Um, have a look <laughs> at that, you know, have a look at you, you know, have a look at your values. So, so what triggered me? Maybe um, what, the, 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 what is it? Uh, have you done any kind of uh, kind of self awareness exercises with your clients on this on 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 trigger points and values? Um, the first chapter of my book is that, which is, again, it's it's set up that way purposely because before we get into the biggest things that foster and adoptive parents are struggling with, you know, often is their children's behavior. But before we dive into that, we really have to look at ourselves. So the whole first book, and and I encourage, and I kind of list out mine in a very rambly way. And then I encourage people to sit and do the same for them and really think, because I think sometimes our values just get picked up and we don't really know where they came from or, or are they a value? So really evaluate, you know, what is important to me? What are the things that I want my kids to remember from their childhood and the things that, you know, I can just let go of? Okay, that's something that's not as important to me in, in my family. Okay, so I'm going to plug your book because, right, so you don't need to Google and find something that <laughs> isn't going to be fit for purpose, right? It's not going to be fit for purpose. What I said about a values exercise, what you need to do is go to the show notes <laughs> and uh, uh, and and get Erin's book. Sorry, li- sorry, listeners. Uh, we don't normally do plugs, but there you are. There, there. We, we, we get away with that one. Um, so yeah, self. It, it starts. Uh, it, it it starts with us. And um, uh, uh, what we? I'm looking at your the sign on behind you that says, <laughs> "Be your beautiful self." <laughs> And the one next door to it saying, it's not whether you get knocked down, it's whether you get back up. Um, so I'm wondering whether there's a we can take a different run at, you know, what we're really talking about, the self, about the self. Because um, I think we, what, what do people say? Um, something like, Judge the behavior, not the child. Is that is that is that something I've heard along the way? Judge yeah, the or or kind of interpret the behavior instead of just seeing the behavior, right? Like often be, our kids' behaviors are communication signals to what's going on, and and as parents, we often just see the behavior that we don't like, or that we want to discipline away, or that we want to improve, and we're we're missing that the kid, the child, may be communicating to us how they're feeling. Yeah. So I think in the Western world, we're pretty good at, at criticizing our own behavior after the event, right? Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, judging our own behavior. And um, if we're going to judge our own behavior, then we're going to judge our kids' behavior as well, and we're going to judge the child. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I'm rambling a bit here. Uh because me and my wife haven't got any kids, and this is this is a, 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 an episode of the podcast fairly and squarely aimed at adoptive parents rather than the adoptees that listen. So, mm-hmm. oh, ha, ha, bring some wisdom, bring some of your wisdom to, to this, and 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 help us through it. Sure. Um, the first thing I'll say is, as adoptive parents, there's a lot of. Um, There's a lot of kind of, especially right now, it's a national adoption month. There's a lot of posts by adoptees. There's a lot of of good things being shared um, around the internet, um, on social media. And it can become easy as an adoptive parent to like 
oh, that's more things I'm doing wrong. Oh, there's more thing. you know, I, I am the problem. I've created this problem. Um, and it can kind of weigh heavy and, and it can kind of make you feel really f- uh, overwhelmed or frustrated. So f- the first thing I want to say to adoptive parents is when you know better, you do better. Um, and when you're learning and, and listening and, he- and hearing these things, um, it can feel like just so much pressure, um, and feel like, oh, I, I'm our, like, this is hard and I, I don't know what to do. Um, but sit in that discomfort for a little bit. Some of the things that I have learned the most about throughout our ad- adoption journey has literally been in those times of discomfort where I wanted to argue and say, well, this is why I do it, or this is, you know, this is correct, or this is okay. Um, but sit in that discomfort for a little bit and and hear, um, listen to, to adoptees, listen to former foster youth, listen to kids who have been in care, um, and, and look for the lesson. Um, so that's my first piece of advice. My second is that we do the best we can with what we have and, and we have the skills we need at the time and we're constantly learning and there's so many different ways to learn. There's so many different things out there, um, you know, so much guidance, but, um, you know, you do the best you can for your child with the information you have um, and, and don't let the fact that there's so much information out there kind of overwhelm you. Um, yeah, so that's, um, first of all, like my encouragement for for adoptive parents, because I know that it can be a hard journey and it can feel very isolating and alone. So connect with other adoptive parents, fit, find other people who have worked in the foster care system or have done international adoption and, and talk to them and, and connect with them so that it feels less lonely. Yeah, Um I'm going to add my bit in uh, what you talked about, the adoptees, uh, um, you know, like listening to adoptees. So um, I was, I haven't been in many adoptees Facebook groups recently because I find them, or or even like a, 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 a Facebook groups that have adoptees and adoptive parents in them, mm-hmm. um, which there are a few. Um, I, I find them basically people uh, just full of people dumping their problems and um so you know people clearly have problems you know we've had agony ants it, it, this is mm-hmm. an adoption issue right there have been ag- agony ants on the radio and uh f- forever and now the agony ants uh, are just or the people who used to go to ring up agony ants now go online to mm-hmm. dump their dump their problems. Uh, what I saw once in a in a Facebook group is a, a post from a, um, a a prospective adoptive parent, and they said, "You know, I came here to 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 hear how you were doing. You're not doing very well. I'm I'm discouraged about actually going ahead with adoption." And I put, you know, like. Be, be careful who you listen to here because um, people come to to dump their trauma. Mm-hmm. Uh, if if they're doing well, if they're doing fine, they don't come on. People, you know, people don't go into groups to say mm-hmm. I'm doing fine, do they? Um, <laughs> that's not that's not what happens. So yeah, we, we we're getting a very skewed. You, you know, we are presented, the Facebook's algorithms, all the social media algorithms um, are, desert, are designed to give us the stuff that Facebook knows is going to um, reflect our views. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it's not, it's not all the, always the most positive view of, of humankind. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then that could kind of make you start to like doubt yourself or, or doubt even adopting at all. Um, you know, and, and I do think it is important to listen to adoptees, but, um, you're right. It can be kind of, it can become overwhelming very quickly and it can feel very, very negative. Um, so I always encourage foster and adoptive parents to, to find, to look for the truth and to listen to the truth and to, you know, then take that and evaluate it and make the best decisions they can for their families. And e- even the adoptees who um, seem like, you know, it's, even the adoptees who are seem to be um, influencers, uh, 
I often, often sometimes find that they're still going through their stuff. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. They, they, they still haven't um, resolved. They still haven't resolved, and I. So even quite influential people um, say stuff. I hear them saying stuff, and I'm thinking, yeah, you know, do you, oh, you're just starting therapy. (laughs) Yeah. And you're an influencer. Maybe you should have done the therapy before you did the influencing. (laughs) The wrong way around. So be very careful what you, who you listen to. Mm -hmm. And be aware that those people think that they're the bee's knees, right? And Mm -hmm. they're still still struggling. Um, Mm -hmm. So flipping it around a little bit, this Mm -hmm. this be your beautiful self and this, that side of Mm -hmm. self-awareness. I'm making, I'm, I'm not sure I'm making any sense here. Um, what's the beautiful self? The self, the self underneath the 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 the, the beautiful parent underneath the sometimes dodgy, the you know the perfect parent with their uh, imperfections. I don't know. Talk. Can you can you talk into that? Yeah, yeah. I think that as we're parenting um, kids who have experienced loss, kids who have experienced trauma, it's really easy to. Um, measure ourselves against other parents, right? That's a common thing. We're, we're comparing our family, we're comparing our parenting, we're comparing our home, or comparing our homes. And um, I truly believe that to be the best parent you can be, especially to kids who are adopted or kids from the foster care system, you really have to let a lot of that go, let a lot of those expectations go. Um, you know we are not going to have perfect homes and Pinterest meals on our tables and, you know, all the perfect decor and our kids in matching outfits all the time. It's, it's, we have put a lot of expectations on ourselves and we think we need to parent the same way, you know, we were parented as, as kids or the way our friends parent their kids. And we forget that, that our kids respond differently. Um, And they require a different parenting style. And it's really okay to be your own self, to be your own parent, to to carve your own path and not do things the same way. Um, For me, that has really looked like, um, and it kind of ties into the values, but like really thinking a lot about the things, um, you know, the way I was parented, I I was raised in a Christian home with, with my dad was a pastor. Um, and my, my mom stayed home with us. And, you know, there are things that I'm so grateful for, for my childhood. And there are things that I'm going to do slightly different with my kids. There's things that I'm going to, um, choose not to do or choose to do. Right. And, um, there's so much pressure on, especially moms, but uh, on parents in general to, to have this perfect family and these perfectly behaved children and this perfect home. And, and I think a lot of our frustrations as parents come from those high expectations. Yeah, yeah. Thing came to mind um, uh, is this is this disease called comparisonitis. Mm-hmm. Comparisonitis, mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know whether you know some of us get that from you know. So if we if we have less perhaps less conscious parents, you know, our, our parents may have compared us to our siblings. Um, but I think um, the the bigger place that comparisonitis starts, and we start learning it from others, is in is in school, right? So the the the, the teachers are very quick to compare who's learning their um, uh, who's learning faster than than others, who's learning, fa- mm-hmm. you know. And, and and we get and we because they do it to us we and they're adults they're the teacher they're the one in authority we kind of take that on and we think that that's the way the world works so we end up doing it because we've seen other people doing it um, maybe our maybe our parents mm-hmm. have compared themselves to 
to their friends, you know, that, uh, you know, so I don't know, have the, you have this in this, in, in this I was going to say the States, there, but I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, it, it, do you have this in Canada, keeping up with the Joneses? Do you have that? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. So our parents, maybe they didn't compare us to our siblings, but our parents compared themselves um, to their, um, uh, to, to their friends, to their uh, to, to their siblings, teachers started to compare us. And, and and these are all kind of unconscious things to a degree. We don't we don't think that we've just we've just soaked it up, haven't we? Like like sponges, because mm -hmm. that's what's gone on in the world around us, and we think that that's the thing to do. So mm -hmm. self-awareness is another part of self-awareness is is kind of spotting that um because mm -hmm. I, I, I love your you, you know as you're saying um when we know better we we do better so if mm -hmm. we know if we become aware of that tendency to compare ourselves um mm -hmm. maybe well the first step is awareness and maybe the maybe we'll, we'll do less of it um and being kind on ourselves even when we do the stuff that we said we weren't going to do <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's so important. I, I, and one of the things I talk a lot about is high margins, right? And it, it's kind of related into these expectations. You know, when we think about our days with our kids and we think about the times where we're most likely to lose our patience or, um, you know, be triggered by our children or have them be triggered and have a meltdown or have an angry outburst or, or what have you. It's often in those times where we don't have time, right? Where it's the morning when we're trying to get out the door, trying to get the kids on the bus, trying to get to work on time, trying to do daycare drop off. It's after school when we're trying to get supper on the table so we can get to hockey or dance or whatever we have to get to. It's those moments. And so, you know, being self-aware is really important, but so is building in time margins so that you have those moments of connection with your kids so that you have those moments where you can sit and drink your coffee without you know kids all climbing all over you or needing you to pour cereal and needing you to get out the door um whenever we can take these little pockets of time and build them into our schedule especially around those times where we are seeing the most conflict or we're seeing the most um you know triggers happening the the more our days will go smoother, the more we'll be able to focus on connection with our kids and and to drop these, you know, like if dinner doesn't get on the table by this time, are we going to be okay? If we are late for a dance because we had a child who was crying, you know, like so much of that is stuck in that comparison, right? The other dance moms are going to see me come late. The you know, school's going to mark my child late again for the 30th time this semester, whatever, right? There's all these, these, expectations society puts on us but then also expectations we put on ourselves and the more we can let some of those go uh, the happier we're going to be the more content we're going to be and the more regulated we're going to be and our kids are going to be too yeah yeah I love what I love the way that you're taking my uh, maybe slightly vague stuff and making it far more practical <laughs> so um what what are the most useful things that you've seen around this um self-awareness piece around this um comparisonitis around this mm -hmm. the, the, the the time margins and building stuff in what, what what's the stuff you know, forget about me and my highfalutin stuff let's let's just dive straight into the mm -hmm. the the most important things mm -hmm. that you've seen in terms of us being the best parents we can be. Mm -hmm. Have you read the business book, The One Thing? Uh, the One Thing. The One Thing. The premise of it is that in business, you focus on one thing at a time. So you create a 12-week calendar, you focus on that one thing, you let other things go for the time being, and you are super productive in this one area at a time. So it could be marketing, could be whatever in business. But I I took that concept and applied it to parenting. So we look at 
if we look at connection and felt safety as the one thing, because those goes hand, hand in hand. So connecting with our kids, connecting with our family and creating a, a safe place, a safe home for them, that becomes our focus. As a parent, We, when we know that we have to hyper-focus on, on something, it allows us to give permission to let other things go. You know, people will often ask me like, how do you do everything? How do you run a business? How do you have all these kids? How do you, he, and I'm like, I don't do everything. My house is a mess. We order those meal plan kits for supper a lot of times, you know, like we, we look at parts of people, right? Somebody's really good at uh, having home cooked meals on their, or home cooked meals every night. Other, other people are really good at doing their own Halloween costumes. Other people are really good at having their house decorated for Christmas. And we assume that's all one person, but they're different people, right? So what are we good at? In my house, I'm really good at connecting with my kids and helping them feel safe and talking with them and spending time with them. That's most important to me. So when I look around my house and I see how messy it is, or I see the dishes that haven't been done, or I think about the fact that we threw a lasagna in the oven instead of making a supper together, I let those things go because my focus is on connecting and loving and helping my kids feel safe in our, in our home. Um, and so I think practically, a, it really, again, comes down to us, right? Like I can continue to compare myself. I can continue to feel bad about the fact that I'm not doing all these things that society tells me a good mom would do, or I should, I feel like I should be doing. Um, and I focus on what's really matter, what really matters. I mean, we've all heard the, the quotes and the sayings about like our kids will grow up and the, the things they'll remember in our home. But it's, it is true in so many ways. Like the nights where I'm like, okay, guys, mom's too tired to cook. Let's look in the fridge and see what leftovers. Like my kids love those nights because they get to eat what they want. And they, you know, like we're all together. Those are the things that matter more than, you know, a perfectly kept house or being on time for every activity we do. Um, so I, to me, it truly does boil down to learning to let go of the things that aren't as important because we're hyper-focused on the thing that is of utmost importance. Yeah. Yeah. I've not read the book. Um, I've, I've, um, I've heard, a, I've heard a, a, a similar kind of focus. Um, and it, this was from sports rather than business. And, and mm -hmm. the question was, uh, it was from canoeing or, 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 or rowing. So it was from rowing. Um, and the yeah. question was, Will it make the boat go faster? Mm -hmm. Will it make the boat go faster? So I guess, you know, you could take, you know, put my two things together um, and say, put our two things together and you say, right, I'm, I'm hyper-focused on connection and felt safety. So will this help my, will this build my connection with my child? Will mm -hmm. this build my, you know, And, and if we say like, so I'm about to, I think I need to tidy a drawer, right? And it's a silly example, but you know, I, I need, uh, mm -hmm. well, I'm not actually, because I'm, I'm, I'm repeating your stuff kind of back to you in a different way, uh, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you recognize because you're a very gifted coachy type person. Um, <laughs> will tidying my drawer, will tidying my drawer um, make my connection with my kid stronger no mm -hmm. unless maybe i tr i tidied the tidied the cupboards with the child and made a, a game out of it who knows you know like i'm mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. will it, will, so if you if you're looking at if you if you're looking at a list if you are if you're running through a list of stuff you've got to in your head then the question is will this build my connection with my child will this make my child feel safer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so easy to do and in, in, in so easy to say it, it does take time and practice because again it's it is very, very much ingrained in us to like do these things and make sure our houses are clean and do you know do all the things and I think that that's part of what leads to burnout and to overwhelm within the home um so it is a skill that you have to learn just like any other skill where you have to practice it and you have to be okay with it and you, you know the first few times I mean it it is such a you know mindset game you know I, I can think of times when I've been cooking dinner and think oh a real mom would not use 
um, pre-cooked bacon. She would make her own. And like the thoughts just come into your head and you have to just push it away. Like, no, a real mom is feeding her kid, child and loving on them. And, and I'm doing exactly what I need to be doing right now. Okay. So bearing in mind this focus that you've got, what are the most, and, and um, clearly they're great. It's a, it's a great focus, you know, I, I love it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, especially the, the, the connection one and the, and the safety one. So if, mm -hmm. what, are the, what are the most uh, effective ways that you found to um, help connect with your kid? Mm -hmm. So that's a great question. Um, and something that I'm super passionate about helping people understand, because I feel like with younger kids, it's very easy, right? Little, little toddlers, little babies, it's easy to meet their needs. We can see they need their diaper change. They need to be fed. They need a bath. Um, and then as our kids get older, we forget that the need for connection doesn't change. It just looks different, right? The way we connect with a, um, a school age child or a teenager is going to be different than a toddler, toddler, but is just as important. And it also is very, can be very simple. Like we don't need to overthink it or have this grand list. Like when we're sitting and reading with our kids, when we're asking them about their day, when we're talking with them, when we're spending time with them, when we're going for a walk, when we're playing outside, um, when we're riding our bikes together, all these things are connection based. Um, but it really is about finding intentional time with them where we're not on our phones, where we're not, you know, thinking about our massive to-do lists or, or worrying about getting out the door when we're just focused on talking with them and being with them and hearing them, um, you know, being interested in the same things they're interested in, um, you know, whether it's Pokemon or books or reading or, or movies, whatever it is, doing the things that they are interested in. So that builds that connection, builds that relationship, but also lets them know that as they get older, we're going to continue to be interested and want to know and hear about their lives. Yeah. So I heard something relevant on a podcast this morning, actually, I was listening to. I know it's a course, it's a course on one, actually. And, but it, it, yeah, it's a course. Um, but somebody was asking a, a parenting kind of question. Um, and she was talking about connection with her child. So uh, a, a teenage, a teenager, teenage daughter. Mm -hmm. And she, um, she was, uh, so a teenager came home from school and, um, you know, the, the teenager was being a teenager and, and not particularly um, connecting. Right. So th this, uh, the, the, the mom thought, oh, uh, felt herself about to make a joke to try and make a connection but she mm -hmm. was doing it in a way that she would have done when she was younger she wasn't it wasn't mm -hmm. age appropriate right mm -hmm. she mm -hmm. kind of caught herself and 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 she thought well if i'd done that if i'd made that goofy joke i would have probably mm -hmm. drove my, my my child away but i was doing yeah. that from um, that was to do with my need for connection, not the child mm -hmm. need for connection with me. Mm -hmm. Does that make does that make sense? She was coming from an insecure place, you know. What's yeah. it gonna take for my daughter to connect with me? So it wasn't about her daughter at all. It was actually about mm -hmm. her. Mm -hmm. and, and she yeah, her feeling her, like her daughter was withdrawn. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Interrupt. Her feeling like her daughter's withdrawn, but her daughter was okay with being, you know, you know, like, yeah. Sometimes we are feeling like less connected with them, but they're they're not feeling that way. Yeah. Yeah. They're just they're, they're happier. They're happier with a different type of connection, especially as a, as a as a as a teen. Um. Mm -hmm. so the um yeah the time one and the the phone thing that's an interesting one for me because uh i i was the one that got you know like i had a black before 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 smartphones or before iphones mm -hmm. anyway there were those blackberry things you remember those 
Um, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I had one of those and I was doing some business with a guy in Australia. So he used to send me emails that way ahead of us in, 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 in the time, in the day, right? So I used to, I started looking at my Blackberry at, at breakfast to see what mm. emails had come in from this guy called Terry in, in, in Sydney. Yeah. Um, and I, I don't do that anymore. That was ages and ages ago. But I kind of mm. set the ground rules. I, I, I was the one that started doing this. And then my wife got an iPhone a bit later on. And I, she she does it. But it sometimes drives me a bit nuts, which is when, especially when, like, the, the phone is between us. You know, we're sitting mm-hmm. opposite each other at the table and she's checking, mm-hmm. checking the phone. Um, what, um, what, what, what's, what's on that sort of subject? What, 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 um, what do you see in, in, in your world and in your client's world? Because mm-hmm. this is my world and it, it, it's not a necessarily adopted parent's world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, obviously with phones, like having access to everything, our social media, our email, everything right there at our fingertips, it can be very easy to to be on our phone a lot um, and we'll pick it up without even really thinking about it, right? And we hear a little notification and we're grabbing it. Um, and then- Oh, turn those notifications off. Oh, turn them off, turn them off. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, what I have started doing, and and everybody's situation is different. And sometimes we use things like I have a business, right? So I'm like, well, what if one of my staff need me? Or what if they have a question? And then that becomes an excuse to carry my phone around all day and be on it. So what I've started doing is I wear my my Fitbit and the my texts and phone calls come to it, but none of my other, like no Instagram, no emails, no anything else like that. And so I leave my phone in my room during the day when I'm with my kids. And then if somebody needs to get a hold of me, like a text or a phone call, I'll, I'll see it come through on my phone and I can run and get my, or on my watch and I can run and get my phone. And that just helps me not be, you know, you know, I'll get a business notification for Instagram and then I, I go respond to it. And then I'm, I sit there for 10, 15, 20 minutes scrolling and be, you know, and then you're with your kids, but you're not really with your kids. And so Um, again, you have to find what works for you. And that's not to say like, that you can't use your phone as a a break or like as a time to like de-stress or decompress because, because that can be important, but it's when we are so addicted to our phones that, you know, we're sitting at the dinner table on it instead of enjoying our family or, or, you know, we're not watching our child at uh, hockey because we're on our phone the whole time. Those are the kind of messages that we want to be careful of um, and be aware of again, like just, you know, add a little time. There's lots of apps that will track how long you're on and on different apps and you can watch that. And, um, you know, just remember that our, you know, our habits, our kids are watching, you know, I've, I've worked with foster and adoptive parents who are so frustrated that their kids bring their phone to the table or their kids are always on their phone and not connecting with them. And I'm like, but what, what are you showing them? What are you, um, you know, making okay from your own habits? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, and, and phones can be like with teens phone can be a really important way we connect, right? A lot of our kids will often text over talk, right? And so sometimes we can text and and check in with them that way and see how they're feeling and see how things are going. So we can use phones to our advantage with our kids, but we also just can quickly, you know, it can quickly turn. Yeah, yeah. So um, what's the question? I'm just uh, conscious of time. What's the the question that I've not asked you, Erin, that you'd like something that that, that I've not, asked you about that you'd like to share some stuff in this context of being I feel like we've covered some really good stuff and got yeah um I guess just another like just another um, I always want to have foster and adoptive parents feel like hope on their journey and I know it can feel kind of overwhelming at times and it can feel like a lot but I encourage you to Um, keep learning, keep listening, um, and just really learn to let go of all the other things that you feel pressure or comparativeness or, um, and just really focus on, on connection and loving your kids well, because that at the end of the day is what's going to matter. 
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> totally. Totally. So um, check out the show notes, listeners, as always. Oh, and before I, I, I forgot to say something. Um, if you want to know more about doing this stuff, uh, how, how to do it, you're already doing it. I do say this on the podcast to people because if you if you're listening to the podcast, you are doing some stuff to be the best parent you can be. So congratulations because you're already <laughs> doing it. You know, you, you, you're already in the zone. Most no, that's not fair. Some people aren't, right? Some people aren't. Um, some people aren't. So um, check out the show notes for links to Aaron on um, social. Don't send her too many messages, right? No, do. Um, if you uh, <laughs> yeah, check, pick out the book, check out the book. Um, the links links to the book on there, and she's also got some some great. Uh, I've I've watched quite a lot of Erin's uh, uh, videos. She does some great brief punchy videos. So. Sign up for those. Sign up for those videos if you liked the uh, sound of what she said, and you must have done because you've been listening for almost an hour. So um, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Aaron. It's it's been great, and thank you, listeners, too, for 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 listening. And we will speak to you again very soon. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. <laughs>